Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Maxwell, and today I'm going to be talking about my new repository querying tool, FedRQ. All right, so first, I'll disclaim this talk with my packaging experience. Uh, my packaging experience has informed the development of FedRQ, and it also informs the examples in this talk. Uh, I guess Rusty Python is a term that Fabio coined, which refers to uh, Python extension modules written in Rust. All right, fundamentals about Fedora. Fedora is an interdependent collection of packages, meaning that each package is part of at least one package ecosystem. And a good package maintainer understands the relationship between their package and others, and their dependency tree, and so on. And also communication is very important. This goes both ways. When you're making some big change, uh, communicate to others and also keep track of mailing lists and the like so you know what changes may be coming to your packages. Uh, no one likes it when you make a change five minutes before the rebuild and then someone finds out that you did something when they see your name in the commit log two years later and then they didn't have their coffee that morning and write a flamey post about you on the devil list and then you're just so ashamed that you quit your job and purchase a horse farm in rural Pennsylvania. Okay, uh, what are some ecosystems? Uh, we have language or language library systems like Python. Uh, there's the Python interpreter, uh, and there's libraries, maybe popular ones such as the Jinja 2 templating engine, and not so popular ones, uh, but even so, those uh, are still considered part of the ecosystem. Um, and then also there's plugin ecosystems such as Ansible collections. While uh, these are predominantly written in Python and are thus part of the Python ecosystem. They're also part of the larger, um, or I'm sorry, they're also part of the Ansible uh, ecosystem, so maintainers need to be aware of changes uh, to uh, the Ansible ecosystem and the Ansible core package and also any changes that may be coming to uh, the Python ecosystem. And then Similarly to plugin ecosystems, which are kind of a subset of a language, we also have su what I'm dubbing sub-language ecosystems, such as the Go container tools. Go was created at Google uh, for container tooling in Kubernetes, so a lot of stuff is written in Go for containers, and they kind of uh, form their own ecosystem within Go because of all the interconnected libraries and such. All right, so how does FedRQ fit into this? So FedRQ, uh, which is my tool, pronounced FedRQ, not FedArc, is a repository querying CLI tool uh, that's built with Fedora developers in mind. Um, it helps package maintainers operate within their ecosystems and understand their package dependency trees. Uh, and it also allows obtaining more general information about the Fedora package collection. For example, in our man page, we have an example that shows how to query the repositories for all packages that depend on bash, whose arch is no arch, and whose name starts with the letter A. Uh, so there's a lot of cool things that you can do if you want to learn more about the nature of the packaging collection. <laughs> um, and then also, our standout thing is that we provide built-in configurations for different Fedora versions and other RPM-based distros, so just with one simple argument, you can switch from Fedora to Amazon Linux, and then Amazon Linux to CentOS Stream, and actually Troy asked, and yes, we do already support CentOS 10 Stream in FedRQ. Um, <laughs> and then we also provide a public Python API, which will be the subject of its own section of this talk. The elephant in the room, um, what about DNF repo query? Uh, DNF repo query performs a similar task but it's uh, intended for a more general audience and it's built into DNF. FedRQ, due to it being a separate tool, is more flexible to kind of forge its own path, per se. Um, it has a more easy to understand interface. Uh, it's made by a packager for packagers, so uh, really the regular day-to-day -day Fedora packager experience is really kept in mind here. Um, and also, FedRQ is based on subcommands where each command does one thing, as opposed to the monolithic repo query command with a bunch of flags, which some people have found confusing. Anyways, 
Um, and then also we have these generic uh, repository classes and macros, so we make it really easy to um, configure any arbitrary copper repository or um, Koji side tags. And just to drive this point home, we have a huge table of all of the different versions uh, that we support. From where you're sitting, it's probably very small, but uh, we have Fedora Stable, Apple, CentOS Stream, Alma Linux, Amazon Linux, uh, Oracle Linux, Rocky Linux, ELN, Amazon Linux. So, uh, and if you'd like to contribute your own contributions or your own configurations upstream, you're very much welcome to do that. Uh, as long as the repositories are open source, and if you have some internal repository or um, personal repository or something that's not open source, there is an ability to add more uh, to your local configuration. Um, what else did I want to add? Um, yeah, so now let's talk about the last construct. This only applies to the uh, CLI. So FederQ has a lot of different plethora of formatting options. Um, we have the standard package attributes such as name and to print out the package name or requires which prints out all the package's dependencies and so on and so forth. Uh, and then we have some custom formatters like the JSON formatter which allows querying multiple different uh, package attributes at once which can be very helpful if you want to interface with FedRQ from another tool whether that's another language which doesn't support the FedRQ Python API or even using the JQ command on the CLI. So uh, it's pretty flexible and I want to make it easy to extract as much or as little information as possible. And then we will talk about requires match later. Okay, uh, now let's move on to the CLI. Uh, FedRQ is supposed to be a comfy tool, so there's all the usual niceties in there. We have a I would say pretty extensive man page um, for the CLI, and then we have a man page for the configuration. FedRQ, you shouldn't really have to uh, mess with the configuration unless you really want to, but uh, you can add additional repository configurations, or uh, you can change some of the defaults, like maybe you don't like the defaulting to rawhide behavior, so it's definitely possible to change that. Then also we have shell completions, tab completions, <laughs> Uh, whatever you like to call them. Uh, they're built into the RPM package by default, but you can always run the command to generate them yourself. Uh, and then also we have a nice uh, mkdocs-based uh, documentation site, um, which includes generated man pages, API documentation, change logs. I worked hard on that, so I hope it will be useful to better Q users. Okay, uh, now we get to delve into our first command. So, um, we'll use our fancy laser pointer here if I can figure out how to get it to work. Um, so, um, we have the packages command, which is uh, the basic command. It um, just queries for a package. It can take a package name or different other types of package specifications uh, we can see here. It defaults to rawhide and the base repo definition, but if you'd like, um, you can uh, pass that by default, and then we see that both source packages and uh, the noarch package are included by default. Um, and then here is a more advanced example. Um, we're using the Apple branch. Um, with the requires formatter. Um, and then also we have a not source option, which is a shortcut to filter out all of the source packages. Um, and then just the usual suspects here for a Python package uh, we see in the dependency list. Um, and notably the Apple 9 branch, it only includes Apple 9. It does not include any other EL-based distribution, which most users will want. So we'll show that in the next example, but the simple Apple 9 branch definition is very useful if you just want to do a simple query for a single package in Apple 9. Um, and now here, we're using the what requires subcommand. Um, if you're familiar with DNF repo query, this isn't uh, super unfamiliar to you, 
uh, given the names of a package, it will spit out all the packages that require the package's names that you put in, so reverse dependencies. Um, and then here we're using the CentOS 9 stream branch with the Apple repo definition. Um, the Apple repo definition includes all of the um, base CentOS repos, CentOS uh, CRB, and then it also includes Apple and Apple Next because that's how you use Apple with CentOS Stream. Um, and then uh, what requires, unlike the DNS command, in FedRQ you can pass as many package names as you want in a single command. Um, so here we are passing Ansible Core and Delve, which is a Go debugging tool, and we can see stuff coming from the Apple repos, from the CentOS AppStream source repos, and you know all this stuff is from Ansible, and then Go toolset is the one for Delve. Uh, and the results here are truncated, so they appear in a legible format on these slides, but I do promise if you type in the real commands, you will get the real results. Fingers crossed. Um, <laughs> and then finally, we have the sub-packages command. Um, this is unique to FedRQ, given the name of a source package. Um, it will spit out all of the binary packages or sub-packages that that source package produces. Rust packaging in this case does not uh, produce a Rust packaging binary package, but it does produce a cargo RPM macro sub package and a Rust uh, SRPM macros package. And here we're using the NA formatter, which only prints out the package name and the package arch, as opposed to all the name epoch version release architecture information, which can make the results a little unwieldy to work with if you're not specifically looking for that. Um, and now I'm the only one standing in between you and lunch, so we're not going to show examples for every single thing, but just to call some of them out, what requires source, also special to FedRQ, is kind of a combination of sub-packages and what requires. So for example, if you had what requires source Rust packaging, it would first find these sub-packages using the sub-packages code, and then it would plug in those to uh, what requires. Uh, and then also we have what requires analogs for weak dependencies, and then also there's a command to print out the, I think there's like 40, there's a huge amount of output formatter options, and this command prints out all of them, and then also they're explained in more detail in the man page. Okay, now we get to show some fun tidbits. Uh, FedRQ does have good support for RHEL and Apple, so FedRQ provides a container image uh, using UBI 9, and then if you register your system with Subscription Manager, which you can use using <laughs> the free uh, developer subscription from Red Hat, then you're able to uh, query the real RHEL repositories using this alias. So um, we're just setting the default branch. Um, the uh, container image includes a special built-in configuration uh, for uh, RHEL 9, um, and then just this uh, function sets up the uh, persistent directories for caching and such. And then now we're able to download packages. So this is using the FedRQ download command, uh, the remote location formatter, which since it's a formatter is available across the entire FedRQ API. Um, we'll print out the full URL to the package on whatever mirror is configured. So here we see it's downloading both the kernel source and the regular kernel package, similarly to the default behavior everywhere else. As you can see, consistency uh, is a big goal of FedRQ, and then it just downloads them. Uh, this is using a pretty rudimentary uh, Python request-based downloader, but it works, and it does preserve any SSL client certificates which are needed, for example, uh, to access the Red Hat CDN. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have a uh, container subcommand, or I'm sorry, a changelog subcommand. Uh, you can filter the entries and it just prints them all out. Uh, the changelogs are stored in a separate metadata file which is not downloaded by default, so FedRQ automatically downloads these for you. Uh, so yeah, that's all for the CLI. Now let's talk a little bit about our Python API. And if you'd like to learn more about a use for the Python API, I recommend you watch the replay of Michelle's talk from yesterday, who's using it, he's using it to integrate into a 
new uh, dependency graphing library, I think. Um, so the FederQ Python API, FederQ has its own stable public Python API. It uh, provides access to the built-in release configurations that I already talked so much about. Um, and then, as some of you may know, uh, there's a transition happening in Fedora from DNF4, which is written in Python with some C stuff thrown in there, to uh, libdnf5, which is written in C++, and all of the language bindings are written using, or I guess generated using Swig. Um, and I've done a lot of work to really bridge the gap uh, between the two APIs. It mainly started as just an effort for me wanting uh, FederQ to work uh, for my own purposes, which I wanted the FederQ CLI to work with both DNF and libdnf5, and then I was like, oh, maybe other people will want this. So then it's now stable and officially public. Uh, this doesn't intend to provide unlimited functionality. It mainly provides the repository querying functionality that FederQ itself uses, um, and then maybe a little bit of extras that may be useful for API consumers. So first, let's go over the essential classes in FederQ. Um, First, we have the package uh, class, which is implemented separately by both the old DNF and new libdnf5 backend, and then the uh, classes in the base module just lay out the interface. So if you're using uh, the new fancy Python type checking stuff, uh, you can just use these classes to annotate any functions that are able to work with either backend. Um, so package compat is just a simple object that represents the package and provides access to the different metadata fields. And then package query is a set-like object which contains package objects. And um, you can use different methods to filter and augment the results in any different way, which is what FederQ does uh, for its CLI. Um, and then we have our own custom helper classes, which kind of wraps all this functionality together and helps provide that bridge between the two APIs. So we have a base maker base helper class, which again is implemented separately in each backend, but there is a common interface which is defined in the base module. Um, and this is able to set up the DNF base session and configure any repositories or set configuration options or versions or anything like that. And normally you shouldn't have to interface with this directly because the FedRQ config um, module provides a nice abstraction on top of that and plugs in all of our repository configurations. And then finally, what you're probably gonna be using the most is the repo query helper class. Um, and the repo query helper class provides a bunch of methods to do various types of querying. Um, and the methods in this class return the underlying package or package query objects from the backend. So now we get to load our configuration. Uh, the get config function uh, will combine the configuration built into FedRQ, any system configuration. Users are welcome to put stuff in the uh, Etsy FedRQ directory, um, and then also any user configuration stored in the dot config directory. Um, and then you can also pass keyword arguments to the get config function uh, to override any of the configuration that was loaded from the file system. So by default, uh, FedRQ automatically detects which backend to use. It starts with DNF4 for uh, backwards compatibility. And then if that's not available, uh, libdnf5. And then if that's not available, it will fail and tell you to go check what you did wrong. Um, but if you'd like to, uh, for example, use uh, FedRQ to load the repository configuration, but then you want to use different functionality from the underlying libdnf5 API, you might want to explicitly set the libdnf5 backend and vice versa. So now that we've loaded our configuration, we're able to create the central repository querying object. So uh, by default, it behaves just like the CLI. Uh, it will load Rawhide by default, but if you'd like, you can pass in a specific branch and repo. So here we are querying F40 and we're enabling the testing repo group. So now that we have that repo query base object, we get to perform our first query. So I already explained what package query compat is. 
So here we are performing a query for all packages named bash and we're filtering it out to only the latest version of bash in the repos, which is what better key packages does by default. And then we are iterating over the query, which causes it to be resolved. And we're using the sorted method here. Um, so no matter which backend you use, the uh, packages will be uh, presented in a consistent order. Uh, if there's some special magic going on here, I re-implemented the uh, Python rich sorting dunder methods uh, in the libdnf5 API using the same sorting algorithm as dnf4. That's neither here nor there, but in case you're curious. Um, and then here is a list of some other resources. Um, there's a lot of API documentation on the website. There's a whole directory of API examples. There's an API outline on the website. BetterQ is itself a client for the API in a way. So if you're feeling adventurous, you're welcome to dig through that code for inspiration and also contribute. Uh, contributions are always welcome. Uh, and then also you can uh, search through my own scripts repository and find whatever uh, ugly code surprises in there that use BetterQ. So now let's connect BetterQ back to the concept of ecosystems. Uh, we're going to show a couple of real world use cases that have allowed me to improve the ecosystems that I work in using BetterQ. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, BetterQ can help perform impact checks, which are copper based rebuilds of a package dependence against a proposed update in human language. That means, for example, if you are uh, you know, building a new Python library, you might want to rebuild everything that uses that Python library against the new version to ensure that everything remains compatible. So by doing impact checks, you can catch any fail to build from source issues in advance or any other type of breakage. Notably, uh, for interpreted languages like Python, this relies on having effective tests in the package because otherwise it could just copy all the you know, Python text files into the package and then when a user actually tries to run it, it will fail and the person doing the impact check will have no idea that that happened. Then also, importantly, uh, impact checks using copper do not handle incompatible version constraints if a package depends on foo version one and you're testing foo version two, uh, copper will happily pull in the old version of foo version one, which can be a problem because then when you actually update foo version two, that package will break. So now we're gonna use an example of an as of yet theoretical Cython update to uh, 3.1.0, which has not been released yet, but uh, when it does, maybe the Python maintainers can take inspiration from this talk. So uh, we're using the what requires command here, which I showed earlier. Um, so we're finding all the packages that require Python 3 Cython and then writing this out to a file, which we'll use later. Um, we're using the source formatter here. So no matter whether it's a package that build requires um, Python 3 Cython or if it's a binary package that depends on Cython at runtime, uh, this will include all of those results using the source component name, which is what you're gonna wanna do because you have to clone those repositories using the source name to rebuild them. And then now, uh, these are all the version constraints. We're using the requires match formatter and there is an NARM alias. So we're searching for all the packages that depend on Python 3 Cython, and then we are plugging that back in into the requires match formatter, which will go ahead and find the appropriate version constraints that match Python 3 Cython in the packages requires. So um, here we see um, all these things. They require Python 3 disk Cython, and then have a certain version constraint. And we are testing 3.1.0, so if a package depends on less than 3.1, uh, that's a big problem. So uh, you would need to go ahead and fix those repositories, either relax the version constraints, fix any compatibilities before you push an update that breaks the world. Um, and then let's say that has magically happened. So now we're able to run the builds. So um, first we create a temporary copper 
and then here we're using the uh, Fedora Rawhide fruit. Fedora development always starts in Rawhide. Uh, and then we're using the delete after days option because we don't want these poppers staying around forever. Once the update has been pushed to stable, we can let it uh, get rid of itself and not clog up the copper team's Amazon S3 storage. Um, and then once that's been created, uh, we can rebuild the package that we're testing. And then assuming that's built successfully, we can iterate over all the dependencies that we wrote to this file in the last step and build them from diskit. And then after all the builds have completed, you can go to the uh, copper web UI, which I probably should have included a screenshot of and see whether everything's passed or if anything's failed, go ahead and investigate. Um, and then another thing that we've done is in the Go SIG, we maintain a lot of different libraries and sometimes these libraries can become stale or we might have a library that um, is just a leaf and nothing depends on it and it just keeps getting rebuilt and rebuilt every six months or we're wasting time updating it or fixing it when we don't actually need it. So um, we have a script that uses FedRQ to go through all the packages that you go to compile and search through the, pack, the binary packages that created and categorize them. So uh, we know, for example, this is all the packages and then the packages are listed by the maintainer and then we have a list of all the source packages that include applications because if a package includes an application, even if it's a leaf, we don't want to get rid of it because people are using that application, or at least I hope they're using it. Um, and then we also have a list of leaves. So these are packages that only provide libraries and those libraries are unused. So then we're able to um, go ahead and retire those from the distribution and reduce our load by that much. Um, so now uh, it's time for the finale. Um, just to talk about what's down the pipe, what features are in development. Um, I'd like to uh, do some more work on allowing recursive what requires querying. So, for example, if you have, uh, you're looking for package foo and then package uh, bar depends on package foo and then another package depends on package bar, a recursive query would allow you to get that entire dependency tree. Uh, and this would require uh, some additional work in the FedRQ API to add support for the package resolution API. Uh, and this would have to be supported by both backends. So there's some work to do there, but I would like to get it eventually. Also, it would be nice to support like uh, being able to run a full package transaction. Uh, so for example, if you're installing Bash, this option would tell you every single package that uh, Bash would install on a new system. Uh, and then also, we don't support comps groups or environments yet, but I would like to add this because I know some people have a use for that. For example, there is an environment for the KDE desktop environment and different types of groups uh, that are stored in the repository metadata for different purposes. So I would like to add support for this. And then also, if anyone here likes graphic design, I would welcome a logo for FedRQ. Then also, there is a uh, Fedora Packager meta package which installs some of the Fedora package tooling and perhaps FedRQ could be kind of the blast tool for package querying and could be installed by default for Fedora packagers. But that's down the road and also there's other tools such as Fedora repo query which is a uh, wrapper around the DNF repo query CLI written by Jens Peterson and Haskell. Um, and then we also have the RPM distro repo query project, which is another wrapper around the CLI, and uh, that is just a bash script written by Neil Gampa. So there's definitely other options out here, but I think FedRQ, well, each takes their unique approach, but I've kind of used my experience to make a tool that I think will uh, be the most easy to use and kind of has its unique model, which at least for my use cases has worked quite well. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for listening. I'm happy to take any questions, and after questions, there's one little bonus slide. Thank you for listening.
Is this microphone? Oh, it works. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah, behind you there's a question. So I really apologize if you covered this and I just missed it. Um, one thing that I've never been able to figure out a way to do is do a reverse sub-package query. So if I have a package and I want to figure out what its SRPM is or what its source package name is, um, um, is that yeah. something you can do in, a Fedor in this or do you know of a way to oh do Oh, yes, it? it definitely is. Uh, so let's just go back to an example that kind of covers this. So um, this is the... Uh, the FedRQ packages command, and you see here we're using we're uh, using the requires formatter. So if you request requires with source, uh, oh. then it will show you the name of the source package. Okay, thank you. I didn't understand that part. I didn't really cover it, so I'm glad you asked. Yes. Hi. So in. Uh in talking about the impact check, that's obviously a, a huge issue within the, the GoSig. Um, it's uh, tangential to this, but is there, um, are, are you potentially working on any further automation of that so that we can have a, a more turnkey impact checking uh, routine for Go, Rust, and all the other ones that have these nasty ecosystems? Yeah, uh, I have played around with the idea of um, kind of a, some sort of CLI tool which uses the Python API and can perform this type of repo query and print out all of the results, but I just haven't gotten to it yet. But I do have a kind of dirty script that I use, but I definitely think that further automation could be very useful to a lot of packages or packagers. Uh, if there's no other questions, I'm happy to do my bonus slide. Uh, can I have the other microphone back? Because this is a very awkward position to be standing in. So um, just like FedRQ, uh, this presentation is uh, using a copyleft license for both the examples and the content. Um, and since we've been doing a lot of work with licenses in Fedora recently, I uh, wrote this little script to uh, use the API and find which package has the longest license tag. So kernel is the winner here by far. Um, and then we have things like GCC and one of the cosmic Rust package in here. So this is just a kind of interesting thing that you can uh, use with, uh, do with FedRQ if you so desire. Uh, this is uh, the amount of characters in the license tag. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you everyone for listening.